So let's go e4. Okay, so this guy plays the French, which we haven't really faced much. Uh, I, there's a couple of good options against the French that I recommend to intermediate players. One of them is called the resigned variation, where I just talk about the lines that we can play and our opponent resigns. That's a fantastic line. <laughs> I was going to say knight c3 here is a good line. Uh, this is like the topical variation of the French. There is also e5, which is called the advance. By the way, the French, if anybody's curious, why is the French called the French? The first person to have ever played the French. Let me see. The first person to have ever played the French was, well, it was Cochrane. It was that same guy who developed the Cochrane Gambit. Okay. So the city of Paris played the French in 1834 in a game against the city of London. And that was very common in the 19th century. The two cities to, for, to play a game and they would submit the moves by telegram. Uh, but but the, the city of Paris is not the first to play the French. Okay, 1751, very strong player. Let's hope he doesn't abort. Okay, let's go e4, e5. We've been playing the Sicilian a lot recently, but let's let's go back to e5 for a second. Okay, so let's see if... Okay, he plays in Italian, so my favorite move here is bishop to c5, knight f6, and either... Okay, so d4 is one of the main moves. This is the, the old main line, bishop b4 check. This is all very normal. Knight takes c4, and now d5. Okay, so this this line, I'm, I'm, play, I'm playing this fast because this is all theoretical line. I actually don't remember it, so I could I could get in trouble here quite quickly. Let me see if I can remember what we're supposed to do here. I think we're supposed to drop the bishop back to f6. He goes rook e1, and then we castle, I think. Uh, there is a way here for black to get an advantage. This is called the Mueller counter gambit. Okay, but this is not the right move, I'm pretty sure, because now... I think we can just take back on c6. And can somebody explain to me, perhaps, why is it that after b takes c6, rook e1, we don't lose our knight? What move are we, we going to have after that? Yeah, we're going to have d5, and we're going to simultaneously attack the bishop and defend the knight. So I think this move, dc, is already a mistake. I think he had to play rook e1, and that leads to a theoretical line. So now we're up two pawn. Well, we're up two pawns. And it just doesn't seem like he's got much to show for them uh, because we're going to play d5. Okay. d5 baby is right. And I think he's recognized it. I did not lose the knight. Remember that I took his knight and he didn't recapture back. And he took my knight, but only after he accepted the loss of his. Now, in this position... I think almost everybody would be inclined to play bishop f5, but we don't have to do that. And again, this is something that I want to make very clear. We are up two pawns and we have a set of priorities. And our top priority is to remove our king from the line of fire of the rook. If that means we sacrifice one of our extra pawns to do that, so be it. He doesn't even take it. Okay, now we can safely play bishop f5 to buttress the knight. That's totally fine. And then we could deploy our queen to d7 in the event of... We could have also... Oh, we could have just taken the pawn. But there's no need for that kind of greediness. So... And someone's getting a big grade after this game. <laughs> okay, queen to c2. So how do we go about doing this? We can... Well, he's attacking the pawn. We can protect it in several ways. The move I like is c5. Let's just push this pawn forward. The knight defends the pawn, and if he takes on e4 with a bishop, well, then we can just recapture with our bishop, and we potentially threaten to cripple his pawn structure with bishop takes b2. Hopefully, this is making sense. So far, he goes knight e5. What should we do here? What moves come to mind? Does anybody want to suggest, perhaps, a way, let's say, to dislodge this knight from e5? How do we get it out of there while deploying another one of our pieces? Mm-hmm. Moves like rook e8 are the, are the glue moves. They're the moves that make our position tick. He counterattacks our knight, but 
trades are good for us. Thank you, Silent Menace 13, for the prime. Trades are good for us because we're the ones up two pawns. We're up three pawns. And now we're going to be up more than three pawns. We're going to be up a piece after we make what move. What move now wins a very simple fork. Queen to d4. Remember, he's weakened the diagonal in front of his king by as soon as f3 is played. You must pay attention, sorry, to this diagonal. Because that diagonal is the key to the kingdom in many cases. Now we take another piece. Queen e7 is right. <laughs> and the game is over. We're up a piece. We're up three pawns. And we're, we have total domination. Let's get the rook involved through d8. Never forget to involve your pieces when you're up material. We have many ways to win this. Uh, let's go g6 to create some luft for our king. Some air. Let's go f5 to defend our bishop. And now we're going to go queen to d2. Force the queen trade. Or... Uh, take a bunch of his pawns or deliver checkmate depends on what he decides to do um yeah we're just gonna trade queens that's the easiest and how do we win this position i've, I've talked about this many times what you want to do is identify where you can create a pass pawn and then create it he's basically creating it for us uh we can also what i was preparing is the move c3 getting rid of one of our doubled pawns so that the other one is going to be passed and uh, this is just going to be a winning position for black. Okay, let's go C3. Well, we got 4,481 viewers. That's ridiculous. And now, well, we can push our pawn. But what's the simplest move here? Instead of pushing our pawn, what can we do just to eliminate any possibility of counterplay by white? We can. What that really means is we need to look for ways to trade rooks. We can do that by playing rook to C2. That's the simplest. We're just going to have an extra bishop and two passed pawns that cannot be stopped. So the game is over. We can resign. That's also, it's always possible. Yeah, nice, nice, nice. Okay, this is over. And uh, that was simple because our opponent messed up the opening. But, oh my lands. Damn, girl, Jab Jam with 25 gifted subs. Oh my lands. This is ridiculous. Ridiculous. That is a huge number right there. We are almost at 36, 3700. This is unbelievable. Thank you, Jam Jam, for another 25 gifted subs. Crazy. Absolutely crazy stuff. And uh, this is ridiculous. Enjoy, guys. Thank you, Telemama, for the prime. It's like I'm obligated to keep playing. Well, I don't know what to say, and he finally resigns. Um, yeah, I mean, this is uh, this is unbelievable. Thank you, Jackster. And we got more subs. We got Jackster A one A O T N with a prime. Okay, okay, I'll I'll consider it. Just give me a sec. Holy smokes! Okay, now I gotta play one because we got Yazazi gifting ten subs. This is the most generosity I've ever seen, and it's been going on like this for days and days and days. He's back. He's back with 10 gifted. Oh, my lands. This is remarkable, ladies and gentlemen. Happy Thanksgiving, indeed. Uh, thank you, Yazazi, for the 10 gifted. There is always a gifting battle going on. 3680. And Ganjay Wanjay with the prime. Jam Jam gifting to Ignore 27. I can't keep up with this. We are 18 away from 2,700. 3,700 is ridiculous. Okay. Um, let's see. Yeah, you guys are awesome. Is understating it tremendously. Um, how do you feel after all this? No, I'm, I'm fine. Xanth 13. Oh, 10 more. It doesn't even end. Oh my god, Xan13 with 10 subs. Oh my god. Oh, I can... This is not happening right now. This is not happening right... This is not happening right... I, I need to keep my voice down because... This is... This is illegal. Montana Chess with 100... 100 gifted subs. And then Proffer with 20... This is actually 
the most progress thing ever. We got 4,000 people watching insaneness happen. Insanity. Montana Chess has previously supported me tremendously with donos. Yeah, Zazie, we got we got a sub from Urka33. Zazie with 10 again. Oh my god, I'm not even analyzing. Holy smokes. Oh, Chuck Cheese Curl of 5. 4,000, here we come. When I hit 3,000, I thought that was ridiculous. What is this? What is this? Montana Chess just gifted a hundred subs, followed by 20, followed by five. G Mario to Pander Law with a prime. Shush about our money laundering. Magno with the, with the gift that's up to Wowzer 78. Over 3,700. I can't concentrate. This is ridiculous. E Dog 3650 gifting three subs to the community. Oh my god. I'm just sitting back and watching this happen as Gem Gem gifting 10 months. Oh my god. Are you serious, ladies and gentlemen? It just keeps on going. I guess the speed run was a good decision. 38-44. Well spoken. Ocelot with a sub. Yeah, we've got and Rob Easy E with a prime. Wow. Keep threatening to leave. Min with a thousand bits. He says you think it's over, girl? Yeah, this is amazing. Blind win nine. Wow. These are indeed Ikaro numbers. Uh, these are incredible numbers. Um, 3847. Yeah, I'll keep going. <laughs> Unbelievable. Excuse me. Well, thanks. I've never seen something like this. I mean, it's like one night after another. Um, oh, definitely. Okay. Uh, all right, let's go. Let's keep playing. We got to keep playing. So this game, really quickly, just uh, this line that he played, this is called the Miller Counter Gambit. And the idea is that he sacrifices a piece, but he tries to, oh, the board is frozen, sorry. Yeah, the board is frozen. My bad, my bad. There we go. And we got BC Crispy with five gifted. Holy smokes. It doesn't even end there. And the key mistake that he made was that he basically took the wrong knight. He should have gone... He should have gone after the E4 knight with rook to E1. 500 bits from Snapboy and 100 bits from Quara PM. And uh, he should have taken this knight so that... It would be harder for us to develop our bishop, but by taking DC, he's allowed us to go D5. Now we're two pawns up, our knight is defended, and uh, and our bishop has excellent prospects. So he played a little bit too fast. And after this, the key move is just a castle, right? We tuck our king away. We don't let him exploit it. And now we go C5, chasing the knight away. Very simple moves. And then we win everything with queen D4 check. Yeah, 4,000 subs. I can't even believe we're uttering those words. We're playing a guy who is 1641. Akos G. Srobles. Let's go E5 again. And let's go with a classical. Okay. Um, let me disable the alerts for a second. Oh, 5,000 bits. Oh, my lands. What is this? Another bomb. I can't even keep up with this. 5,000 bits from Jim Jam. Let's go Knight F6. This is the main line of the Rai Lopez. It should be familiar to most people. Um, these are just the main moves. We're developing our pieces, the normal squares. And at this point, he's threatening to capture our Knight and capture on E5. So the time has come for us to remove the Bishop from its post on A4. Now we need to open up our own Bishop. And so we play the move D6 to support the center and open up the bishop. This is still well within the range of the main line of the Rai Lopez. Thank you to Giovanni95 for the tier one, appreciate it. Now we castle and the main move here is h3. So he plays d3, which, which is a move. It's not the most active move, but it is a move. And, um, and, and, and there's many ways for black here to develop my pieces, right? We can develop this bishop to g4. 
we can, well, bishop g4 isn't as good as it seems. I'm going to play this move even though it's not as good as it seems. And after the game, I'm going to explain why bishop g4. Maybe he'll show us. Now I'm going to go knight to... Well, no, actually. Let's go... What should we do here? Should we do... Let's get this bishop out of this annoying little square on b3. We're going to go knight a5. We're going to expand on the queen side with c5. It's a very typical idea. Now, if he knows what he's doing, and we're going to bring our knight back into the game, he'll get his knight to g3. And that's exactly why the pin isn't as effective here. He played this perfectly. He's forcing our bishop back, and we could have put our bishop there in the first place. So we wasted a couple of time. You know, he's playing this incredibly well. d4 is good. Now we're going to take... And the other problem that we're encountering here is that he's threatening a fork with d5. So we're going to have to take on d4. But now what we're left with is a... I'm not sure I like this time consumption, but what we're left with is a weak pawn on d6. A Giovanni 95 with five gifted subs. So what do we need to do in this position? What we need to do in this position is activate the bishop on e7. It's currently kind of passive. And so we'll need to put it on f6. But to do that, we need to move the knight away from d7. Thank you, the Giovanni 95. It just keeps going and going. Uh, this is incredible stuff here. Okay, so he goes knight d5. Let's get rid of that knight. That was an annoying knight. Let's get rid of it. And now we can put our bishop on a very nice square, on a very nice diagonal. Yeah, Jam Jam is indeed the greatest ever. g6. Okay, blunting his influence over the diagonal. Obviously, he was threatening checkmate. Oh, thank sorry, AC7 IO men. Now, this knight on d7. Where can we put it? Where should it where does it belong? Where does this knight belong? It belongs either on c5 or it belongs on e5. Either of those two squares are fine. And when you have a situation like this where you have two possible moves, you're not sure which one to make. It often makes sense to make a third move, something a little bit more flexible, so that we can only develop our knight when we're absolutely sure of where we want to put it. That's why I'm going to play the move rook to c8, deploying our rook to an open file. Because maybe I want to put the knight on e5, maybe I want to put it on c5. I don't know. Uh, it, it depends on what he's going to do. So that's why we're going to hold off on that decision for a second. Okay. By the way, queen a5, also something to point out here which would fork his rook, his rook and his pawn on a2. That's another possibility in the future. And uh, yeah, we want to, you want to be flexible in chess. You don't want to put all of your cards on the table in one go. Yeah, knight e5, knight c4 is the idea. Okay, so now it's definitely time for a little fork a ruski, attacking the rook, attacking the pawn, using our queen. And uh, this, is, uh, this is just starting to collapse for him now. Look at how our pieces are positioned. I still haven't moved my knight from d7 because I haven't needed to. You know, there's been, there's been no need to do that. Uh, instead, and I just got my queen trapped. I just got, I could have gotten my queen trapped, but that was not so simple because of knight e5. That would, that would have been pretty close. Okay, what do we do? How do we play? We'll talk about that after the game. He failed to spot a very big chance here. What should, now what I'm seeing here, whoa! Oh my goodness! What? This is this is unbelievable! Unbelievable! Forty-one from Polar Bear BC. As I play ninety-five, this was the moment for it, and we've got him tied up. But look at this man go! Are we at thirty-nine hundred? We are. This is actually legendary. And I don't know what to say. This is legendary. Tonight might be the night. This is incredible. We're going to go rook to c3. Getting his queen, dislodging it from its attack over the rook. Look at how all of our pieces are operating at, at their full capacity. Doubling now on the c file. We're going to go after this pawn on d5. What's our sub count now? 3,900. Board has been frozen. My bad, guys. Sorry, 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 sorry. I know. And that's a glitch that I need to fix. Uh, that's an OBS glitch. My apologies for that. So we're just going to bring our queen back. Now, he's gone rook to c1. He's gone rook to c1. What should we do here? How do we exploit the drawback of that previous move? 
very simple solution. We don't need to trade. See, this is where people go wrong. They're like, okay, I need to trade rooks. We don't need to do anything. This rook is perfectly well protected. So we can just take the pawn. This might be a record of some sort. We're at 39. I mean, I don't know what to say. Now we can take the rook. Of course, if he takes our queen, then we take his. We don't want to allow the queen to come to c8. So let's go queen c4. A trade is in our favor because we're up two pawns. That endgame is going to be completely winning. Uh, that endgame is going to be completely winning. And so he resigns. That's a good resignation. Uh, and that was a pretty simple game. With one exception, I think I made a key blunder that could have been exploited by him. Let's go straight to that moment. Now, uh, as I've explained previously, as I've explained previously, uh, uh, how should you judge a pin? The, the way that you should judge a pin is if a the pinned piece, right, the knight on f3, is defended by a pawn, then by definition, the pin is going to be less scary. If this knight was not defended by a pawn, the pin would be more scary. So you shouldn't rush to always assume the best square for a piece is somewhere where it pins an opposing piece. So I would have considered putting this bishop on e6 to blunt the influence of the bishop on b3. And uh, what ended up happening is that he attacked our bishop. And if, he, if we had dropped it to h5, uh, we would have potentially allowed the knight to get onto this very, very nasty square on f5. And that would have been followed, for example, with bishop to g5. So it's okay. We got our bishop back to e6, but now he's struck with d4. So what were we talking about here before I got rudely interrupted? Well, I cried for 4,000. I'm not a big crier. Um, that's just one thing I'm just not big on. So we activated the knight, then the bishop. The one moment I wanted to focus on in this game, I very sloppily grabbed the pawn on a2. And ladies and gentlemen, the move bishop b3 would have... Well, actually, oh, there's a way out. This, oh, this is cool. This would have trapped the queen. The queen is nowhere to go. If I take the rook, that's defended. But black has a way to counterattack white's queen, and I think black is still in good shape here. Can somebody spot? Yeah, we are 75 away. I mean, this is unbelievable. Uh, the lack of support in this. Just kidding. <laughs> what should we do here? So there's a couple of ways to go about attacking white's queen. Rook to c3 is one, and knight to e5 is the other. I've talked about the situation several times. The situation where both queens are hanging. What should you be looking for when both queens are hanging? What you should be looking for are desperado sacrifices. First of all, this knight on e5. Do you see that white's making contact with that? So white can capture it. Okay? And we're back in the same situation, and now we're a piece down. So this is no good. Rook to c3 may seem to run into the same exact problem, right? Queen, to c queen takes c3. But... If you calculate a little bit further, we can actually take the queen and then take the rook on e1. So if we just specifically calculate the line, uh, this works. You can also take the rook on b1, by the way. So either option works. And so rook c3 was the saving grace uh, that would have allowed me to save the queen. I didn't actually see bishop b3, though. Well, I did see it, but I didn't notice that it, that it traps the queen. So, um, so, so this was a lucky escape. Isn't that bishop trapped in the variation? What if queen c2? Well, queen c2 just drops the bishop to the queen, drops the queen to the bishop. How does my bishop escape? A couple of people are asking, isn't the bishop trapped? Well, how does white actually trap the bishop? It's not easy to trap the bishop. Um, if knight e5, rook e5, yeah, is that fightable? So if you go here, uh, this is fightable. You have two rooks for a queen and a piece which is a pretty significant material advantage for the queen and the piece. But uh, you could fight this. I mean, you could try to double rooks on the c-file. You could try to double rooks on the c-file, and you could try to to infiltrate that way. Uh, and and, and by, by definitely, I would not suggest anyone resign here. I would, I would play this myself. Uh, Bishop h6 does not win an exchange there. So if you go here, and then you go bishop h6, I saw this. You attack the rook and attack the bishop, but you can move the rook to e8 and simultaneously defend the bishop on, on e1. And, and then the bishop could, could saunter over to g7 and evacuate itself. And remember that black is also up a pawn. Okay, one second, please. Yeah, I can't believe this viewership is ridiculous. 
Huh. Okay. Um, let's play one more. I'm feeling lucky today. I wonder why. Does anybody have any questions? And by the way, the way that the game ended was pretty uneventful. I mean, he, he, he managed to sort of stabilize, but because of the tremendous disparity in peace activity and the fact that we're up upon, White's position simply collapses. Okay. Um, let's go. Let us go. Okay. Let's go e4. So we've been playing e4. You know, and he plays the Scandinavian. Okay. So Scandinavian by our opponent, which is not an opening that I recommend to intermediate players. Now, that doesn't mean it's a bad opening. It's, And, and after the game, I'll talk a little bit about why it's actually not a bad opening. But um, let me just make a note of this. So, of course, the, the main drawback of the Scandi, just visually speaking, is that Black has only developed his queen. And we are not only developing our pieces, but we are also occupying the center. So it seems clear that white should be better here. But, wow. So he's also wasting time moving the same piece to squares. What should we do here with white? What should we do here with white? How do we get rid of this pin? This pin is kind of annoying. I, I mentioned that it's not too dangerous. But uh, if we wanted to develop with an eye toward defending against the pin, we would just go bishop e2. A lot of people don't like making this move. A lot of people look at this move and say, yeah, the bishop is passive, but it's okay. Not every one of your pieces needs to be conquering, uh, you know, the fringes of the Roman Empire. It's okay to have a single piece on e2. And it's okay to just castle and play chill. Now, we have a chance now to capitalize on the fact that this knight is no longer pinned. Where can we put this knight? Where can we put this knight in order to exert some pressure on black's position? Absolutely, let's centralize it. I love centralizing my knights. Uh, that sounds weird, but okay. I like centralizing my knights. And uh, we're slightly better here. Our opponent is playing this quite well. Now we need to think about where we want to put this bishop. We can put it on d2 to pressure that queen through the lens of the knight. I like the move bishop f4. I think it also nicely supports the knight on e5. And also... If you think of it this way, look at the bishop sort of skewering that pawn on c7. I would say x-raying it. So something like knight c4 could come to mind. But before we do anything, I want to expand a little bit on the queen side. Let's, let's grab a little bit of space on the queen side and open up the possibility for some queen b5 ideas. Now this queen on, on b6 is in a little bit of trouble. What should we do? How should we play? Why did we play a4? We created a stronghold on the b5 square. Knight c4 would come close to trapping the queen, but queen c6 would be possible. What can we put on b5? We could also go a5, but then we'd have to reckon with queen takes b2. Uh, and I don't actually see a way to trap the queen there. So let's go knight to b5. That's the reason why we played a4. We establish a nice little stronghold. And now the knight is pressuring the c7 pawn. How are we going to exploit... And now we have an incredibly strong move, which is very important to find. We want to put the knight on c7, but we can't do that because he would take. So we have to move this knight away with tempo. No, no, no. If we play a5, we give up the knight, right? Pawn on a4 is fulfilling a crucial role of defending the knight. So what we need to do is move this knight away with tempo so that the bishop combines with the knight, guards c7, and the move that does that is knight to c4. Very strong move. This move basically wins the game. If he plays queen a6, we trap his queen and deliver the fork. So he's got to go queen d8, and he's got to basically move his knight away and say, okay, I'm down in exchange. The game goes on. It, the game is not over when we win an exchange, but, well, he doesn't have any compensation for it. Things are going to be very rough for him. Uh, so we'll see how he manages to defend this. He can also, okay, knight to d5. That's a very strong move. He actually found a move that I missed. And the purpose of this move is that if we take on a8, then he takes on f4, and our knight on a8 could get trapped. Very strong move. Very strong move. We actually have to backpedal here. We can play the queen e5. That's an interesting move. Yeah, let's go queen e5. Then he maybe goes f6 or bishop f6. If we move our bishop away, then he takes the knight. So we're going to have to backpedal and take on d5 and sort of reorient ourselves 
Let's centralize the other night. This happens. I mean, people are good. I'm telling you guys, people are good at this level. Uh, I actually missed that move. Now, this doesn't normally happen, but, you know, these people are underrated. Let's support our center with the move C3. I'm going to play a little bit faster here because I'm a little bit low on time. Um, and let's see what he does. Yeah, men can confirm. Rook C3. This guy is good. We're just going to deploy our pieces. I'm not doing anything extraordinary. I'm just putting my pieces on better squares. Another thing I might consider here is to play H3 uh, just to create a little bit of luft for our king. Thank you, James R., for the sub. Three months, appreciated. Okay. Let's now deploy our queen to g4, threatening checkmate. And if he takes on e5, what piece should we take with here? Should we take with a pawn or should we take with a rook? Yeah, this opponent is playing very well. Rook. Absolutely the rook because we need to keep open the possibility of a rook lift. We need to keep the pressure going. He's playing well. We, we need to drop our queen back to defend the pawn on b2. Now, one idea that we could have in this kind of position is to push this h pawn forward and try to provoke weaknesses in his position. Okay, f6, we're going to drop the rook. But now this pawn is weak. Where should we put this rook? We should put it on e1 to, def to attack the pawn. Let's not forget also about the plan of going h5, h6 and provoking weaknesses in his position. Okay, um, we should also... Yeah, let's go. Let's Let's... We can sack the spawn, right? Because then we're going to put a queen on h on, on h6. Now, we're going to move the rook to f3, skewering his king, potentially preparing the move queen e5. He creates a very serious weakness. Where is this queen going? It's going to g7. He's preventing that threat. We're going to defend b2 first. We're going to keep this queen nicely centralized. He's probably going to go queen c7 if he plays like a gm, which he probably does. Uh, we're slowly starting to chip away at his position, but yeah, this guy is not 1500. Okay, um, we also could consider doubling or tripling rather on the e-file. Thank you, Lexigif, for the Twitch Prime. But he's good. He's good. But that was that a mistake if we take... Wait, let me calculate. Take six. Queen of five, rook of six, queen of seven, rook of seven. Yes, we have a beautiful sacrifice here. Let's go. We can crash through with rook takes f5 check if I calculated correctly. Queen takes f5 and it's checkmate because after... Oh, or is it? Yes, it is. Where should we go now? Where should we go now? This is the key move. It looks like he's covered against all of the checks. But boom goes the diamond. Queen takes h7. And we go to e7 with checkmate. And that is game over, Red Rover. So we got him in the end. This guy's just good. Let's let's give credit where credit is due. This guy is just good. And uh, we, we managed to outplay him. Okay. So I want to unpack that key moment after he played knight d5. I know some people are a little bit confused at what happened there. Why did I not take his rook? So let's talk about that briefly. Okay. So first of all, a little bit of chess history. The Scandi was played the first time. That's pretty funny, actually. Let's talk some chess history. The Scandinavian was first played in the year 1475. I've forgotten that. Now I remember. Here's a piece of chess trivia I've shared before. As Hojo Jordan brings us one step closer to that magic number. Thank you for the prime. Now, chess is a very old game. It's existed for several thousand years. But chess has not always existed with modern rules. And when chess came to Europe around the 13-1400s, the first ever game of chess recorded in modern history, played with modern rules, was played between, I believe, two Spanish monks in the year 1475. And that game featured the Scandinavian, Mr. Vinoles, who played the first ever game of chess rec recorded with modern rules. Thank you, Admiral Jones, gifting to uh, FWIP for the Sox was played with the Scandi. So it was played in 1475. And then after that, in 1837, so there was about a 400-year gap between the first time that the Scandinavian was played and then the second time it was played, uh, which is kind of cool. In any case, I just want to—I want to fast forward really quickly to the moment when he played this move, knight c5. And there's—I want to explain this, and then I want to share one very important piece of it. Uh, why is the Scandinavian not good for beginners? And openings like the Scandi are not bad per se. 
But in order to be able to play them well, you need to learn how to break the rules, right? Because you're moving the queen around in the opening. Thank you, Hojo Jordan. Really appreciate it. You're moving your queen around and you need to, okay. I've made the analogy before to driving. So let's say you're learning how to drive and your instructor says, and he puts you in a bus before you've ever learned how to drive a car. Okay, does that sound like a good way of learning? Uh, that has all these added complexities. I actually quite admire people who drive buses. I can't imagine how that's possible. But first you need to get the basics down before you add these twists. And so openings like the Scandi or openings like the Perk, you know, they require you to, to have possession of all of these additional controls. And in my opinion, that can actually sometimes curtail the proper learning process. Uh, so that's why I usually advise against these types of openings. Now, the other thing to point out is in this key position, we did not take on a eight. Why not? Because knight takes f4 would have followed. And if you guys will notice, this knight on a8 has no passage back. If you try to go queen e5 to evacuate the knight via c7, actually black has quite a beautiful move here. A uh, nice little tactic that starts with queen takes d4. And then picking the queen off. And this knight just seems to be dead meat after knight a6. Uh, because that rook is just going to go around and capture it. And the thing is, if you go to c7, it, the knight doesn't have any prospects from there either. Now, you guys might look at this and say, hold on a minute, hold on a minute. How did you see this? How did you know? Well, it's pattern recognition. Because I've seen other openings, such as an opening called the Baltic. The Baltic is a response to the queen's gambit, bishop f5. And in the Baltic, this occurs very frequently if white falls into a certain trap. He goes e3, allows knight b4. Can somebody tell me what black should do in this position? Can somebody tell me what black should do in this position? Well, yes, I'm down the exchange there, but you're going to lose another piece. One second, guys. Nope. Nope. Queen takes pawn, boom, boom. And you win a second game. Sorry, you win a second pawn. By the way, e3 would be also interesting, trying to pave the way for the knight to c2. But then the knight drops back to d3. I would say e4, e5 is the best way to start. Uh, because then again, you learn how to follow the rules. Although I guess here, queen takes d4. So that would also be good. But I wanted to show the, the, the sort of the the influence of pattern recognition on your thinking. And I used to fill up entire notebooks with, you know, this kind of stuff, you know, noting down these interesting patterns. But what did we do in this game? We said, okay, okay, you got me. I'm just going to take on d5 and white still has a perfectly fine position. So what I was going to tell everybody is if you meet with a move that you haven't seen or you didn't see something, you don't want to lose your you're cool, right? You, you want to make the most out of the situation. And, and if that means backpedaling and admitting your mistake and getting a, a normal position, then then that's what that, that means. But you don't want to stubbornly go for a strategy or, or a line that you know is bad. Uh, you want to give yourself the maximum amount of chances. And what did we do here? We provoked a bunch of weaknesses on his king side. And eventually that led up to a sacrifice and checkmate. Rook takes f5 is a move that you just have to look at. Right, uh, And you have to look at this move because you ask yourself, what is the drawback of his previous move? Whenever your opponent plays a move near his king with a pawn, uh, then you need to immediately understand, okay, what, what impact did that make on his position? And it's clear to anyone here that the pawn on f5 is now not as well defended. And so you got to be optimistic, right? If you calculate rook f5, you see that his king is out of squares. By the way, Magnus Carlsen... I swear, I saw a Magnus Carlsen game where he um, where he had a very similar combination. He had a very similar combination. If you guys will give me a moment. This is a program called Chess Space. It's a program that sort of all the GMs use. It was developed originally in the late 80s. Uh, it's pretty costly. But if you're over 2,000, I would say that uh, it, it it is a very... It, it's an indispensable tool for any GM. Uh, one thing that it allows you to do is it allows you to find 
any game that you want. It allows you to search any position to see all of the games that have been played from that position. But I remember this game. So this was a Karokan. And let me go to the important moment. Magnus actually played a brilliant game. He sacrificed two pieces in order to attack. Now he sacrifices a rook. And he basically, well, I'm going to show you guys the checkmate. He lifts the rook up. And in this position, he goes queen f5 check, rook f6. And now can somebody tell me the final move of the game? What is the final move of the game? It's not queen h7. Queen h7 lets the king escape via e6. It's queen to d7. And this is checkmate. You guys see the similarity? King on f7 sandwiched between the rooks. If we look at our game, well, I would say it's pretty similar. Uh, so I was thinking about that game as I was delivering this mate. I think there's there's something distinctly, distinctly similar uh, about this. And so... Yeah, that's sort of how pattern recognition works. You see enough of these games, they're beat into your head, and you sort of, you know, that, 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 that circles around in your mind.